and put it up on put it up on YouTube. So we're going to talk about what's called image geometry. Uh, how do we take three-dimensional shapes in the world and convert them into what are essentially two-dimensional representations, pictures, photographs, images, which are only a two-dimensional representation of what actually happens in the world. So to recap a little bit on the last lecture, the last lecture we really finished off talking about blobs, right? So you have uh, through a bunch of filtering operations, filtering on, on colour, you end up with binary image, these white blobs, uh, white objects against the black background. We want to be able to describe their position, we want to be able to describe their size, uh, their shape and their orientation. And that's really where you're all up to in, in the prax, I'm guessing. Uh, some are perhaps more progressed than others and maybe we've got some problems with software or understanding we need to get to the bottom of. But that, that's all good, you're on, you're on track. Uh, for achieving the goals of the PRAC exam. We talked about this equivalent ellipse thing and we did some exercises on this uh, in the tute on Tuesday night. Uh, what we're doing is we're figuring out an ellipse which has got exactly the same inertia properties as the original blob that you have in your image. And inertia is a pretty abstract con concept, doesn't have too much to do with vision and pixels, but mathematically it's very useful. It allows us to compute the parameters of an ellipse which is, you know, in a sort of an fairly simple geometric shape that's got an aspect ratio and it's got an orientation. And uh, we can use that as a proxy to describe the aspect ratio and the orientation of an arbitrary object that we have in our image. We talked about how we can use, and that ellipse is computed from moments uh, of the image, second order moments of the image. We can also use information from the perimeter of the object. Uh, we can, from that we can grind out another measure called circularity which is one for a circle and less for something that's not a circle. We talked about this operation called mathematical morphology, which allows us to filter an image based on size and shape. So we can get rid of little blobs that are either too small or are not, not, not the right shape. We can get rid of holes that appear in an otherwise perfect blob, perhaps because we didn't choose our threshold too well, perhaps because there's flicker in the lighting, the binary image isn't quite perfect. We can patch it up using this morphological processing and that functionality exists in the toolbox that you've been using. And this diagram's got an error in it, uh, it's pointed out the lecture on, uh, on Tuesday, but we can take an original raggedy shape, we can dilate it, make it bigger, fills in the hole, makes it bigger all the way around, we would then erode it and it should be basically the same size as the one on the left. Uh, we're missing a bottom row here. Uh, so it's like we glue, glob on a whole bunch of pixels all around the outside, slather them all on, and then we go around and grind a row of pixels off all around the outside, and uh, the shape has been uh, somewhat improved. So the main game for today's lecture and for uh, next week's lecture as well, in prep really for the next, next round of labs, is this process of image formation. So a long, long time ago, uh, human beings weren't so developed we made very crude representations of the three-dimensional world and we painted them on the walls of our caves. So we don't have any sort of pers perspective here. The sizes are all wrong, right? These are very primitive, it's like children in a kindergarten. You know, a house is the same size as a person, you know, their head's as big as their body. Uh, quite a primitive form of representation. Uh, and this is, this is where we were at as a species uh, 40,000 years ago or something like that. It took quite a long time before we really understood uh, perspective. So this is from the Renaissance era. This is a, this is a lovely picture. I've actually seen the real one, this for real. Uh, and you know, it's pretty gorgeous. It looks very realistic. And most of us can probably sketch in this way. If any of you have done technical drawing at school or something like that, you know uh, how to create this perspective effect. You know, it's all about construction lines and vanishing points and things like that. Uh, and you, it's all about geometry. And if you do the geometry right, then you can create images like this that look very realistic. Uh, our eyes fill in the missing dimension. So that's flat, right? I mean, that's all, all those colors, all those lines are all exist on a plane. But when we look at that, we think that it's three-dimensional because we see a lot of three-dimensional images with our eyes. We fill in the missing information. And this is a cheap trick. Uh, it's quite a popular form of art in, in, in Europe. A French call it trompois. And this basically you paint a picture on your wall that looks like a window and a scene outside. Uh, here's another one. This is someone's kitchen and they've painted a door and then a path going down to, down to the sea. It's a little tacky. Uh, 
and it's not a terribly realistic Im image, so you can tell that it's a painting, but the illusion's kind of cute. Uh, some street art, uh, and this guy's got a wonderful website. If you haven't, if you haven't visited it, uh, that's not a hole in the, it's not a hole in the, in the pavement, and yeah, it's not a piece that's lifted out. It's just chalk. Uh, this guy is brilliant. Uh, I've never seen it for real, uh, but there's a lot of, lot of his images on the web. Uh, there's another one. Uh, it's just stunning. Uh, and all of this would be constructed or drawn in such a way that you have to be at the right place to get the effect. So all the geometric construction lines will only work if you stand in roughly, there's going to be a sweet spot where it's all going to look gorgeous. Uh, another one. Another one. Uh, I have no idea how long these take to, take to produce. Uh, they're epic. Uh, and uh, this one I really like because it's actually the, the plank across the chasm, right? That's chalk as well. And so the bicycle, real bicycle is kind of perched on a, on a chalk plank over the, over the chasm. Uh, I, I quite like this one. And here's another one. This, is, this one is truly epic. Uh, this is just massive, uh, like the edge of a, the crumbling edge of a, of a glacier. Uh, but clearly, this is not three dimensional, right? This is two dimensional. This is drawn with chalk on a plane. So we know it's flat, but our eyes are so good at filling in the missing geometry uh, that we get a very vivid uh, sense of depth perception. Uh, and you can mess with that. And so probably most of you know this, uh, this picture by Escher, uh, which again, it's, uh, it's, it's a plane, right? And he's made it look three-dimensional, and then he messes with your mind because it's clearly not possible to have this thing in three dimensions because the water is just flowing endlessly downhill, right? Uh, so if you, you, you follow the path of the water from up, falls from the top over the water wheel and then runs back onto the top of the, uh, up to the top again. Uh, and Escher's got quite a lot of pictures that mess with the three dimensions in this kind of a way. So there are a lot of cues that we look at and give us uh, ideas about size and, and relative depth and we can be momentarily tricked. Uh, so this is one I found on the web, some random lady somewhere. And at first glance, you think, what? <laughs> She's got a very little friend. And then you look and you see it's, it's quite posed. And if you go to the Eiffel Tower or the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you see all these people taking pictures and holding it like this, or sitting it on their head and, think, and so on. Uh, but at first glance, you get a very striking impression of what's going on here. And then your rational mind kicks in and you think, no, that can't really be the case. So what we're going to do is we talk about how images, um, how images are formed. So here is a picture of uh, Neptune. I uh, don't know where that was from. And we're just going to pick, for example, a number of points uh, on the statue of Neptune. So we're just going to pick some points on his knee, on his hand, and whatever. And we've talked already about how, how light uh, falls onto, onto a scene. So here's some light uh, coming in uh, from, the, from the sun from the blue sky and it lands on Neptune and it, all these different points in the scene then scatter that light in all sorts of different directions. Yeah? And I've only highlighted five points here. Every single point on the statue of Neptune is reflecting light that's coming in. Yep. And we talked about the two different ways that light's reflected. We had this specular reflection, that's the reflection that happens off a mirror. And we have the reflection that happens off a rough surface. It's called Lambertian uh, reflection, Lambertian scattering. And that happens from diffuse or matte surfaces. And I gave the example of the moon as a perfect example of, of a Lambertian scatterer. So although the moon is actually spherical, and the edges of the moon that you can see there, the normals are pointing almost sideways. It really is very spherical. But it looks actually quite flat. It looks uniformly oriented, even though some parts of the surface are pointed a very, in a very different direction to you. Right? So the front of the moon, light comes in, it reflects straight back at you, but out here, the light's coming in at a, at a glancing angle, enough of it is still reflecting back, just from the very edge of the sphere is coming back. It looks almost as bright as the middle, and that's a characteristic of Lambertian scattering. So going back to our, our statue of, uh, of Neptune, light's coming in, some of it's going to come back in a specular flat fashion, most of it's going to come back in a Lambertian fa fashion. It's made of stone, it's rough, it's a matte surface. So there are all those points in the world, and let's just, if I hold up, so there's a, a, a statue of Neptune over there, light coming off it, right, and I hold up a piece of paper. What am I going to see on the piece of paper? I'm going to see an image of, of, of Neptune? No. 
So every point uh, on this piece of paper is going to be illuminated, is going to have some light hitting it that comes from almost every point on the statue of Neptune. And that's what I've shown in these rays here, right? That they, from all these many, all these many points, uh, all illuminate any point that I might choose to, uh, to have uh, on, my, on my image plane. So if I just hold up a piece of paper, no image is formed. It's just, it's the average of all the light that's coming from the scene. Uh, if I order the rays in some ways and I put a, a plane in front, an opaque plane with a hole in it, then we do some ordering. And so the rays that come from all these different points on the statue of Neptune pass through this thing, this little hole, an aperture, often called a pinhole, uh, and it creates an image that's upside down uh, on any plane that I have behind it. So if the statue of Neptune's over here, I hold up a piece of white paper, I don't see anything on this, but if I build an opaque wall and put a little hole in it, then I will get an image of the statue upside down on my piece of paper. So anyone ever done this? Anyone made a pinhole camera when they were a kid? All right, I've done that. So you just get a cardboard box and you put some greaseproof paper over one end, you put an aluminium foil sheet over at the other end, put a hole in it, and you get a very, very dim image. Uh, so this is an effect that's been known, I think the Chinese known this for 5,000 years or something, uh, and this is a very old picture, I think 1500s or something like that. So you have a temple, dark inside, you can put a little hole in the wall of your temple, and if it's bright outside you get an inverted, up, an inverted image projected on the inside of the wall of your temple. It doesn't have to be a temple, any room would do. So, here are some pictures that I found on Flickr, I think, of people who've uh, been staying in hotel rooms and the blind is such that, or the curtain, there was a little hole in it and the, it, and the room was otherwise dark and it created an inverted image of outside onto the wall of their hotel room. So in the background you can sort of see, you can see doors, you can see the floor, you can see a cupboard and superimposed on that is an upside down image of the outside world. Uh, I've, never, I've never experienced this, but anyway, there's quite a bunch of pictures out there of people who've, uh, who've done this. Uh, some crazy people uh, at a retired, retiring Air Force base in the US built the world's largest pinhole camera. So they got a whole aircraft hangar, made it all light proof, they put a little hole in one end, and then they put up a big... Uh, big piece of negative film, right? So this big piece of cloth that you can see all those people down there holding, they made that, uh, they soaked it in uh, light sensitive chemicals and then they held it up there and they did a really, really long exposure. And so they made basically the world's largest photograph. Uh, it's basically as big as the edge of a hangar. And there's a URL there you can actually go and uh, you can look at it and see how they, how they produced it. That's, it's pretty awesome. So this is, there's no lens, there's no glass in this, it's just a very dark room with a hole in one end, produces an image. It's a very dark image, and that's why you need to take a really, really long exposure. So let's go back then to the, the example that I've been using, our, our statue of, of Neptune. And uh, so all the rays go through the pinhole and hit what we call the image plane. That's the plane on which the image is formed. The image is upside down. One of the problems is that the image is very, very dark. So anyone want to hazard a guess as to why the image is so dark? Yeah, that's right. Of all the light that's coming off the scene, most of it is just going to uh, smack into is going to smack into the wall. Not very much of it's going to go through the hole. Right? So the light that's coming up a statue is going in all sorts of different directions, and you're only taking that which is going through this tiny little hole. So the amount of energy that can come through the hole is very, very small. You make the hole bigger, more power comes through, the image is brighter, but it also becomes blurrier. Uh, so this, perf this geometric abstraction that I showed you no longer, no longer applies. Okay, so the geometry of this kind of image formation, I'm going back to the little temple example now. So we've got a face outside, an inverted face inside. The geometry of this is really pretty simple. Uh, so we assume that the object outside is a distance z away uh, and the image is formed the distance f away, f is a focal length, and the height of the object and the height of the image, capital Y and little y respectively, then the relationship between these is just similar triangles. Yep. So that's pretty easy. So I can write the ratio of y over z is the same as little y over f. Uh, if I know how far away the wall of, that, of the temple is, 
with respect to the wall that's got the hole in it, that's the distance f, then that's going to control how big the image is. Yeah? So if f is very large, then so the wall's a long way away, the image is going to be much bigger, the wall's much closer together, then the image is going to be uh, much smaller. So that's how we, we form an image. Is the geometry is really pretty simple, it's just similar triangles. And the same applies in the orthogonal direction, right? So we talked about the height. Also, if we displace it sideways uh, in the world, it's going to be displaced sideways on the image plane. And everything's inverted. So something that's uh, upwards is going to appear downwards in the image. If it's to the left in the real world, it's going to be to the right in the image. Now, we can uh, collect those relationships there and we can rearrange it so that the image plane, what I call the image plane coordinates, little x and little y, that's the dimensions in the image, are related to x, y, and z in capitals, which is my convention for what's happening in the world. So capital letters in the world, little, little letters are on the image, and that's the relationship between the image, image dimensions and the real world dimensions. So we can think of this as a, as a function that maps x, y, and z capitals into little x and little y. So it maps from three dimensions into two dimensions. A three-dimensional coordinate in the world is mapped into a two-dimensional coordinate in the image. And that's what this whole image formation process does. It crunches a three-dimensional world into a two-dimensional projection that I can print on a piece of paper. One dimension has been lost. And there are consequences of throwing away a dimension. You can't throw away a dimension casually uh, without there being consequences. And we'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, uh, so this is before I mentioned about why the image is, is so dark. And that's because a lot of the rays just hit the opaque wall and don't go anywhere. They just uh, turn into heat, right? So uh, that's why the image is dark, because most of those rays are going to end in smacking into the opaque wall and uh, becoming heat. So the way we get around this is we don't use a pinhole. Uh, we use a chunk of glass. We use a lens. Uh, and depending on the, the diameter of the lens, it allows much more light to come through. But the geometry for a lens is a little bit different to the geometry of the pinhole. It's first order approximation, they're the same, but there are some, there are some fundamental differences, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So most of you high school physics did thin lens model, yeah? I'm not looking at seeing a lot of enthusiasm for the thin lens model. We're going to revisit the thin lens model in a moment. Good to know you've seen it before. So the important thing with a lens is the diameter of the lens, which is shown here as phi. And on a, on a posh camera, uh, you often find that that's one of the, the specs of the, of the lens. You often see it written on the uh, inside of the lens. It would probably be too far away to see that, but in this lens it says uh, what its diameter is. And it's a 40, it's a 40 millimeter uh, diameter glass lens. The other number that you often see inscribed on the lens is the F number, uh, capital F. And that's the ratio of the focal length of the lens to the uh, diameter of the lens. Uh, it's a dimensionless quantity, but it basically is related to light gathering. If, F, if the F number of a lens is really small, it means it can gather a lot of light. It'll let you take pictures in low light situations. Big F number, not so good. So web cameras have got really big rubbish F numbers. If you, you know, got a, a nice SLR camera, it'll have a very low F number. And the focal length is related to the magnification. Uh, if you've got a zoom lens, a right, big focal length, it's the telephoto, it's zooming in on something that's very far away. Uh, so it's got field of view like that. As you reduce the focal length, you know, the field of view increases and uh, you go to wide angle, uh, wide angle mode. All right, any questions with any of this? Any amateur photographers amongst us? Okay, so some of these concepts will be familiar if you're a, a camera geek. All right, so that's the F number highlighted there on the lens. This is a picture that I really love. This crazy guy, George Lawrence, back in 1900, he was contracted by a railway company who were very proud of their new locomotive. So they contracted him to build the world's biggest camera to take a picture of what was probably the world's biggest or the world's best locomotive at the time. So uh, that's George Lawrence's camera. Uh, big piece of glass, big bellows, probably a glass slide inside to uh, capture the image on. And it was what well, takes photographs that are eight feet wide. Uh, and that's just the negative. Uh, so heroic stuff. Thin lens model. I told you it was going to come. Uh, now this is just an approximation. In most cameras there isn't a thin lens, there's usually a whole bunch of lenses uh, that you can approximate 
a ser the series of lenses by the thin lens model. And the way you figure out where the image is formed is to do some simple ray tracing. You draw a ray from the object right smack through the middle of the lens, call that the pinhole ray. And then there's another ray which comes through the forward focal point, uh, hits the plane of the lens and then becomes horizontal line. Where they intersect is where your image is going to be formed. Now, what's interesting with the lens is that the, the, where the image is formed depends on how far away the object is from the lens. So with our pinhole camera, it didn't matter how far away the object was. The image on the wall of your temple is always going to be in focus. With a lens, that's not the case. So this is the payoff, right? You get much more, much more light, you get a brighter image, but you've now you've got a focus problem. And so you can see that uh, where I've got that inverted image, I've got a distance minus zi. That's the distance at which the image is formed. Uh, that's the image plane where you've either got your, your CCD sensor or your piece of negative film. And here's the thin lens model equation, which relates the distance of the object, Z, zo, uh, the distance at which the image is formed, zi, and the focal length of the lens, which is f. Right? Focal length, small for a wide angle, big for, uh, for a zoom or telephoto picture. So what happens is if the object is at infinity, so if zo is, is equal to infinity, then, then zi will be equal to f. You can work that out pretty simply. So if the image is a long way away, the image will be formed on a plane that's a distance f away from the lens. But as the object comes closer to the camera, the image actually gets formed further behind that image plane. Uh, and that's why you have a focus problem. Uh, the geometry doesn't quite work out. So you have to, what you have to do is crank on, no, on a more manual camera, right? You rotate the lens, right, to focus it. There's a focus ring. And what that's doing is actually screwing the lens out away from the focus plane so that the distance, uh, so that the image is formed on the plane where the film is. Yeah? So all you're doing is pushing the, the lens away from the image plane, and that's how cameras focus. So here's our projection model again, uh, and we can, I, it was just a, it's just a two-dimensional drawing before, let's draw uh, x and y axes in here, and so we have the coordinate of the object in the world, capital X, Y, Z, the coordinate on the, on the image plane, little x, little y, related by that equation that we saw before. As we said before, it's a mapping from uh, three dimensions to two dimensions. The geometry is exactly the same, really, as it was for the pinhole case. Uh, and we call this a perspective projection, because uh, it obeys the rules of perspective geometry. It crunches three-dimensional numbers into two-dimensional numbers. So, as I said before, you can't throw away dimension without there being consequences. And this is a consequence which in phase value is pretty, pretty mad, right? So we have these lines which we know are parallel, but they don't appear to be parallel in the image. So this is what we lose. But we look at that and that seems to us completely normal because we've got perspective cameras in our heads, right? So our eyes are perspective cameras. They've got lenses. They have an image plane, which is the retina with all the uh, rods and cone cells on it. So this is not surprising to us. Uh, but this is the underlying maths is we crunch 3D into 2D and uh, things, bad things like this happen. Uh, here's another one, picture of some trees uh, which are all vertical uh, and, and parallel but they all appear to be converging. Uh, here's another one, so this is the wheel across the river and yeah, we know it's a circle but it looks like an ellipse if you look at it from anything apart from uh, normal to the plane of the wheel. So what's going on here, this perspective projection that we wrote the equations for before, maps 3D to 2D, the consequence is lines always appear as lines, right? That's the good thing. So we saw that with the railway tracks. But parallel lines are not necessarily mapped to parallel lines. There's only one case when parallel lines are mapped to parallel lines in the image. Anyone know what, what situation that is? Yeah. Yeah, so the lines are in a plane and your camera is looking at that plane, norm, normal to that plane. Yep. In that case, then your parallel lines will be parallel. So the perspective projection does not guarantee parallel lines are mapped to parallel lines. They, they will be in one special case, but not in general, no. The other consequence then is that angles are not preserved. So you take a picture of a shape uh, and the angles will be, will be wrong. The other thing that it, that it does is it maps a conic section to a conic section. So you met conic sections before? The hyperbola, the parabola, 
the ellipse, the circle. Yeah? So these are a whole family of curves that you get by slicing and dicing cones. Yeah? So depending on which way you slice and dice it, you get those four mathematical shapes. Hyperbola, parabola, ellipse, and circle. So all perspective projection guarantees is a conic is mapped to a conic. So we saw before in the case of the wheel across the river, it maps the conic, which is a circle, to another conic, which is an ellipse. So these are the rules uh, that apply to any shapes that are, uh, that are observed using this perspective projection that we get from a pinhole camera or a camera with a lens. The other consequence of this perspective projection, say we've thrown away a dimension, uh, is I say that there's no unique inverse. So if I've got a picture of something on the wall of my temple, right, there's a shape there, I can't tell how big is the object that cast that image because that face will create an image like that and so will that one and that one and that one and that one. So the other thing you can't tell is really how big something is. You can't tell whether, if I'm looking at somebody, are they a really tall person a long way away, or are they a, um, are a very, very short person very close to me? Now, that's a sort of absurd example because there's a whole lot of other cues that you would use, and you've got a whole lot of domain knowledge. You know that people are only going to be within this kind of size range. But in general, you can't tell a large, distant thing from a close, near thing. And this is a topic we'll, re we'll return to in some of the lectures very late on in this, in this unit. You, you can't tell the absolute size of something unless you've got some other hints. And there are lots of other hints. We use maybe eight or nine different sorts of, we call visual cues, to figure out how big things are and how far away they are from us. Uh, now, you probably know about how to represent coordinates as, um, as a vector. So in, a t in two dimensions, you can represent the coordinates of a place, of a point, as x and y. Yep, there's the two coordinates. There's another way you can do it in what's called homogeneous notation. And I always put a little tilde on the top if I'm using homogeneous notation. So we can have x, y in Cartesian coordinates. I can represent the same point as x, y, 1 in homogeneous coordinates. And you're going to say, well, OK, that's OK, that's fine, but it's a bit daft. Why do I want to just put an extra number on? You'll see in a little bit why we'd want to do that. So we refer to these as, homo as homogeneous coordinates, the ones that have got, actually got three numbers, and Cartesian coordinates, the ones you're more familiar with from, uh, from, uh, from geometry and, and whatever else. Now, we can convert between the two. To convert a Cartesian coordinate to a homogeneous one, I just whack an extra one on the end, yeah? Uh, so it's got three numbers. To come back the other way, if I've got a homogeneous coordinate with three numbers in it, I call them x tilde, y tilde, z tilde, to bring them back, we divide by the third element. So we take the first element, divide by the third, the second element, and we divide by the third. This is starting to look suspiciously like the projection equation that we had before, right, with the z's in the bottom. Uh, and this is why homogeneous coordinates are gorgeous. Uh, so I can, if I write this relationship here in matrix form, so I have x, y, and z, the world coordinates of something, multiplied by that matrix, we can multiply that out. We can see that x tilde is equal to f times capital X, uh, and so on. And if I convert those homogeneous coordinates back to Cartesian coordinates by dividing by the third number, then that is the relationship that we had before. Yeah. So what's really good here is that this perspective transformation involves dividing by z. Right? That's, why, that's why it does funny things to scale. That's why things that are far away look smaller, because we divide by z. That's why lines, that the railway tracks appear to come closer together, because the further apart away we go, z gets bigger, and we're scaling it by z, so things appear to get smaller and closer together. Right? So it's, very, it's a non-linear operation, because we're dividing by something. But if we do it in homogeneous coordinates, the, divi the division's gone away. It's completely linear. Uh, and that's really very powerful. Uh, so this, when you do this perspective transform, this annoying divide by z thing goes away. Uh, this stuff is not going to be in the exam. It's, sort of, it's mathematical. It's useful. It's going to be helpful to us in the next lecture to derive something that you're going to use in the prac. So just sit back and enjoy the gorgeousness of homogeneous coordinates. Uh, 
that matrix there, we can actually split into two pieces. Uh, we can factor it out and this f the matrix on the right hand side is really doing the scaling and zooming. It's multiplying by F. Uh, so that's where the, the focal length comes in and the matrix on the other side is just doing a dimension elimination. It's taking three dimensional numbers and throwing away one dimension. Uh, so that's what that matrix does. So that's another way of, another way of thinking about it. Now, Oftentimes in computer graphics and in computer vision, people do things in a slightly different way. So instead of having the world and then a pinhole or a lens and then the image, right, they rearrange it and they put the image plane in front. And so the rays come from the world, they pierce the image plane and they all converge on the origin. And this is called the central projection model. Uh, it's, the maths is exactly the same, but you often find books, people sometimes flick between this central projection model which is, look, is different to the, the pinhole and the lens, which is very intuitive. Uh, this is less intuitive, uh, but you often, often see it in the literature. And then we can do, if, if our image is a digital image, then we can say, okay, on that image plane, we divide it up into little cells, they're the pixels, and we put a coordinate system across the top. We have a U-axis and a V-axis, and then we have to introduce another matrix to do some scaling from meters. Uh, which is in sort of natural dimensions on the plane into pixel dimensions. So we divide by the dimensions of the pixel and then we end up with numbers that have got coordinates of pixels rather than coordinates of meters. And you can do some, uh, some more crazy stuff and I'm gonna go really quickly through this. You can cascade all these matrices together. You have another matrix which says, where is the camera in space? What's its orientation? What's its position? And then you can end up with a completely general expression that says, if I know where my camera is, I know its focal length, I know the position of a point in the world that that camera is looking at, I just crunch through all these numbers and come up with its coordinates on the image plane of that particular camera. Right? It's all done very beautifully in matrices and using homogeneous coordinates. Not examinable, just gorgeous. All right. So these are some of the, the consequences of perspective projection that I mentioned before. And this perspective projection model, it does crazy things like make lines parallel, make circles into ellipses, uh, but we can sort of do it in the opposite way as well. If we understand the geometry, we can draw something in two dimensions that looks three dimensional. Uh, so it's just the function and it's inverse. It's all about geometry and it's really simple geometry. Ultimately, it's just triangles, though you can express it very nicely in matrix form. There's many other ways that you can capture images uh, that are not perspective. So fisheye lenses, for instance, have got a really wide field of view. So with most cameras with a, t with a glass lens, there's a limit to how small a focal length you can get. Uh, you increase the field of view out to about this, and then it's almost impossible to make a lens out of glass that can have a focal length that gives you a wider field of view than that. So you end up going to something like a fisheye lens which can have easily 180 degree field of view. You can see all of that. The consequence of that is we can't even make the rubbish laws of perspective projection hold. So now lines don't appear as lines, right? They appear as circles. Uh, so there's a new type of geometry applies here. I'm not going to talk about that, but basically lines get mapped into circular arcs. Uh, but artistically, really, really useful. And for robots, actually quite useful as well. It's useful for a robot to have a big field of view and it can crank through the maths and work out. If you've got a good model of the lens, I can work out what is a three-dimensional shape of things, even though they look very distorted in the image. There's also, you don't need to use a lens to form an image. And actually a lot of the sort of most powerful image formation devices don't use lenses at all. They use reflections, they use mirrors. So Newton built the first reflecting telescope way back 1670 something, because he had trouble making a lens that was big enough. It's much easier to make a mirror, uh, a big mirror than it is to make a big lens. And so yeah, he built a, a ref the first reflecting telescope, Hubble telescopes, reflecting telescopes. So the biggest telescopes on earth are all reflecting telescopes and biggest telescopes in space. So here's a, 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 type, of, a type of imaging device, a panoramic camera. So it's, it's uh, down the bottom there is a, a normal camera with a glass plate on top and then a stalk and suspended on the top of the stalk is a mirror. It's not quite parabolic, uh, it's similar to, to a paraboloid. And so rays from all around are reflected off that mirror and then down into the standard camera and its lens. 
and that gives you a panoramic view. So you can see a typical image here on the, on the right hand side. There's a black spot in the middle of that image. Anyone know why there's a black spot in the middle? It's the stalk, yeah. The stalk's a bugger and there's not too much you can do with, with that. Sometimes they uh, have a glass tube and uh, suspend that from, uh, from, the, from the walls of the glass tube. Some cameras have three uh, supports around the outside, so you don't have a spot in the middle, but you then have three blind spots around the outside. Uh, so this is a panoramic camera. And you can buy these as attachments for, for your camera. Uh, again, the geometry is quite weird. You can see the lines are going to be mapped into, uh, into curves. The only lines that map into lines are those that are radial. So next thing I'm going to do is just talk briefly about the focus problem. So we said before with a pinhole camera, there's no focus problem. Everything is in focus. The trouble is that the lens is, the image is just really, really dark. So the, what we need to do is if, I, I've drawn here now in the bottom right, a whole bunch of rays. So from the object through the lens, and they all converge on a point on the image sensor, which I've drawn there as that kind of gridded thing. Yeah? So all of those rays appear at a single pixel on that sensor. Now if the image, if the object moves uh, in such a way that now the image is formed something like this, now we have a problem, now we have a focus problem because all the rays from that object, instead of hitting a single pixel, they're hitting a whole bunch of pixels. Yeah? So they're all smearing out and that's why we see a loss of focus. Instead of the light being just at a single point, a single pixel, it's now being spread across many, many pixels. And we interpret that as blur. Right? The, that light is being smeared out across the, across the image. And so that's, that's a bit of a problem. And one of the reasons that this is a problem is that all we do at a pixel is record the amount of light that's falling on it. So it's a photodiode. The, light, the photons come in, they get converted to electrons. We count, they they accumulate over a small period of time and then we measure the voltage. We say that's how much light came in. So all we're doing is seeing the amount of light that's coming in. We're throwing away some really valuable information here and that is the angle at which the light comes in. We, our, our sensor make no account whether the light ray comes straight in or comes in from 45 degrees. We just add it up and say okay that's a photon, I'll have that and we, we add it to the total. And that gives you a very impoverished view of the world. So really what you'd like to do is capture something that's called the light field. Now the light field is a much more sophisticated version of all of this. And it is, can I describe every point in this room, right? Every single ray of light that, that, that's, that's, that's in this room. So every single point, which direction the rays of light are going for, for this whole room, right? So it's a really complicated thing. It captures the intensity, the color, and the vector direction of light everywhere. And an ordinary camera doesn't do that. It doesn't, care, doesn't care, care a hoot about the direction of rays of light. But if we could capture the light field, the complete light field of this room, then I could synthetically compute what the room looked like from anywhere. So if I captured the light field just like that, with a lot of computing, I could see what it looked like from over there or from over here. Uh, and that's the... That's the the great excitement about light field cameras. And you can capture a light field. So there's been a lot of research on capturing light fields and it basically involves having a huge array of cameras, uh, capturing simultaneously uh, the light from the room from a number of different viewpoints. And from all of this together, you can capture the light field. Uh, and so here's another big array of cameras. Uh, and this is used a lot. You've probably seen in movies, The Matrix, where they do the stop time effect. Yeah? So you just see the, the scene at this one point in time from multiple points of view. Yeah? That's coming from light field cameras captured with these great big arrays. So here's some guy's homemade portable light field camera. Uh, uh, here are some examples. Uh, you can see some, some advertising ones there. There's a car surrounded by a huge ring of cameras. So this stuff is, you know, it's. It's mainstream, it's certainly used in, in high-end movie production, high-end uh, advertisement production. Uh, so pretty expensive, right? A lot of cameras, a huge amount of computers to capture all of those images, a whole lot of computing to try and synthesize their real image from the whole lot of images. Uh, and you can retrospectively, retrospectively focus them. It's pretty awesome. So this is a light field camera. And they're not that expensive. So how do they work? What they do? 
a normal camera, you've got the image plane where all of those rays hit, right? And they light up the pixel and you count the number of photons. What the light field camera does is that instead of at the image plane, they have an array of micro lenses. And so those rays that are coming in at different angles end up being focused onto different pixels on the, on the image plane, which is now further to the, further to the right. And one of the things that they're thinking about is these days there are so many megapixels in cameras. Nobody really needs 16 megapixels to take an image. You don't need 32 megapixels. So what they did is they made the choice, well, okay, let's trade off some of the megapixels for recording information about the angle. So the Lytro only produces one megapixel image, which is pretty crude by modern standards. But they take something like a 16 megapixel camera and use a 4x4 four four grid of pixels uh, to represent the different angles that the ray is coming in at. So that's their trade-off. They're having, uh, you end up with less pixels, but at each pixel then I know the angle of the ray. And from that then I can compute the light field, and from that then I can do this cool retrospective focusing. So that's the design trade-off that they made. Because the, the guys who are building sensors keep upping the number of pixels, and most people are saying, yeah, the hard drives are just filling up with images, right? It's just, it's too much. So I think it's, a, it's quite an interesting, quite an interesting trade-off. So today's been a bit of a, a bit of a rave around image formation. Uh, most of it's, uh, I think, just because I, th I think it's interesting and cool. Uh, but some of it we will use uh, to come up with some techniques that we will use in the prac. So take-home message is that the simplest camera model you can make is a so-called pinhole camera. It produces images which are inverted and dark. We can whack in a lens to gather more light, uh, but that then it gives us, the, we have to focus the camera then. Uh, pinhole, we've never had to focus, the trade-off is we need to focus. All of these things, that when they create an image, you crash out of dimension, 3D becomes 2D. And there are consequences of this, right? The consequences are on, uh, on lines, on parallelism, on angles, uh, and on conics being mapped to other conics. Uh, it's a nonlinear relationship, inversely scaled by depth. Uh, it's linear if we express it in terms of homogeneous coordinates. Homogeneous coordinates, we are going to meet again. Uh, uh, they're your friend. And, but there are many other ways to form images, right? You can have not just the normal camera uh, that you're familiar with in your phone, that you have in your head. Uh, you can have fisheye lenses, panoramic cameras, light field cameras, there's lots of ways of gathering, gathering images. So that's it for today. Uh, we'll go again on next Tuesday and we'll carry on this image formation theme. If you want to go on the field trip and you didn't put your name on the sheet last night, come up and put your name on the sheet. Thanks.